I want to welcome everyone who's with us to a special event on forging a democratic alliance to combat transnational kleptocracy against the backdrop of Putin's invasion of Ukraine. I'm Damon Wilson, President and CEO of the National Endowment for Democracy. We are gathered here at a time when Vladimir Putin's Russia is attacking Ukraine and assaulting the very concept of freedom. Our focus, of course, is on support for the courageous people of Ukraine. But the world's response is also focused on how to stop Vladimir Putin and undermine his ability to wage war against democracy. And that has a lot to do with how Putin and his cronies, how the regime have enriched themselves at the expense of their own people and have used that by using our systems, now using some of that wealth to wage war. So that's why we're so pleased to be hosting today's event to coincide with the release of a remarkable paper by Oliver Bullo, An Offshore Cold War, Forging a Democratic Alliance to Combat Transnational Kleptocracy. We're so grateful that we have Oliver with us from Wales. He's being joined along with Heather Conley, who's the president of the German Marshall Fund here in Washington, who in her own right has exposed the Kremlin's playbook. I'm gonna introduce them in a, in a moment, but as I was preparing for this event, I received a note from Representative Tom Malinowski, who's been a strong voice on these issues of kleptocracy. And he said, for too long, the United States and our European allies have allowed Russian kleptocrats to have the best of both worlds, to make their money in Russia, where there is no rule of law, and then shelter it in New York, Paris, and London, where our laws protect them. Western greed has thus enabled Russian corruption and empowered Putin's mafia state. As bombs and missiles fall on Ukraine, ordinary Ukrainians and Russians should see the yachts and private planes belonging to Russian oligarchs and top officials sold at auction, and they should see police tape around the villas and luxury apartments Russia's elite built abroad, and then we should use these seized assets to aid the Ukrainian people and rebuild their nation. We must close our doors to illicitly acquired wealth coming out of the world's dictatorships and open our hearts to their victims. So this conversation is coming on the heels of a sea change. Oliver has been out there and so has Heather beating the drum for years about the problems we face, the need for democratic unity and action. We're now talking today with a sea change in which there are opportunities for democracy. First, we saw the Biden administration has defined corruption and kleptocracy as a national security issue. And they used the Summit for Democracy in December to launch an administration-wide uh, approach to this that we'll talk about. And second, and more importantly, in days, this attack on Ukraine, the unprovoked attack, has put this effort on steroids with extraordinary amount announcements that could not have been imaginable coming out in the past previous days. So combating transnational kleptocracy is a longtime priority for the NED and our International Forum for Democratic Studies, where our senior program officer, Melissa Aden, has been done tremendous work to promote cross-regional research and connect counter kleptocracy activists with journalists, policymakers, and NGOs. We've seen it from the front lines of the partners we support across the world. And so today's conversation is couldn't be more timely as the world watches Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Oliver Bulo has been in demand as one of the most more influential voices highlighting how Western enabling of money laundering of kleptocracy regimes like Putin's Russia has fueled the crisis. So today we're going to ask our speakers for their insights into the current situation, but also to look broader to the global challenge that we recognize this is. Um, Oliver's paper is now available on the NED website, www.ned.org. I really encourage you all to read it. So let me briefly introduce Oliver, one of the leading voices on com combating transnational kleptocracy, a journalist, the author of numerous books, including Moneyland, an economist book of the year. He served as a caucus editor for the Institute for War and Peace Reporting, security correspondence with Reuters, Moscow. He's a longtime friend of the NED who's published with us in the Journal of Democracy and a valuable partner at many of our forum workshops. I'm delighted that he's joined today by Heather Conley. Heather is a remarkable colleague, thinker, individual, and friend. She's the new president of the German Marshall Fund of the United States. She's a friend of the endowment and our mission. And she's here to share her thoughts on the paper, but also the broader challenges that kleptocracy poses to democracy. And prior to joining GMF, uh, Ms. Conley served as Senior Vice President for Europe, Eurasia, and the Arctic at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, where she developed the acclaimed Kremlin Playbook series 
a dedicated research effort that examined the doctrine and methodology of Russian malign economic behavior and its methodology across Europe. She's also a former state official responsible for Europe and a close personal friend and colleague. Um, all right, I want to turn to both of our guests. Let's start with Oliver. I want to zoom in a little bit to talk about the implications of kleptocracy for understanding the crisis in Ukraine, but then also have some time to zoom out as this challenge is a global one and has ramifications far beyond the current crisis. But let's start with the clear and present danger of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Oliver, give us a sense of how Putin's kleptocracy has related to, has fueled what we see unfolding as a conflict in Ukraine. And given what you're arguing for, what's your assessment of the extraordinary actions that have been taken in response? Over to you, Oliver. Um, I think in order to understand what's happening now in Ukraine, we need to briefly go back in time a bit to 2014. Before 2014, um, uh, the systems in, in Russia and Ukraine, though they were not identical, this, the Ukrainian system was always a bit more pluralistic. They had many aspects in common. They were both kleptocratic, ruled by an extremely greedy, very small circle of oligarchs, cl uh, business people closely lied to pol politics, politicians closely lied to business, you know, who, who had a lot in common. They abused the international financial system, hid their money offshore, and, and generally robbed from their own people. Um, in 2013 to 14, Ukrainians got fed up with that. Um, they, they demonstrated throughout the winter. They drove out their president, Viktor Yanukovych, um, who fled to Russia. And since then, Ukrainians have been struggling to build a better system. You know, there has been, it's been hard, very hard, but you know, with thanks to an incredibly courageous civil society, and you know a small real cadre of really remarkably uh, imaginative politicians they've managed to force through some important reforms and really you know it's been tough let's face it they haven't turned their country into Denmark yet but you know they've been doing really well um, and it is clear that something about what the Ukrainians have been doing has just enraged Putin um, just enraged him in ways that, that don't really make any sense. Every, lots of friends of mine who, who, like me, used to live in Russia or now still write a lot about Russia or think a lot about Russia are just trying to get their heads around what is Putin thinking? You know, this, this word denazification that he's using again and again, that he is wanting to denazify Ukraine, you know, a country with a Jewish president, only the second country ever to have a Jewish president and prime minister simultaneously, and yet supposedly they're Nazis. It, it doesn't make any sense. And I think, and I'm very persuaded by the argument used by um, Russian activists who allied to Alexei Navalny and so on, that it's essentially the threat to Putin here is because the Ukrainians are trying to dismantle a kleptocracy, that this is a threat that, that is intrinsic. You know, it, it strikes to the heart of the system Putin has built. And if the Ukrainians can do it, then perhaps the Russians can too. So, I mean, it's obvious that this has nothing to do with Nazis, right? We know that the Ukrainians aren't Nazis, so they can't be denazified. And it's nothing to do with nationalists either, you know, the far right parties. I'm not denying that there are issues with far right politics in Ukraine as there are in all European countries, but, you know, they received a very small share of the vote in the last elections. This is about the Ukrainians' desire to build a better system, a system where ordinary people get to decide their own destiny and not oligarchs decide it for them. Um, and so, you know, what we're seeing really in Ukraine, and, and you know, it sounds sort of almost ludicrously portentous to say it, but what we're seeing is the clash between two worldviews of what a country should be. You know, should a country be a place where a very, very small group of crooks, to be honest, decide everything and everyone else acts as sort of, you know, cannon fodder or, or, or livestock to be exploited? Or should a country be decided by its citizens, you know, for the interests of everyone? And, and so it, it's existential, really. It's a battle between, you know, democracy and money. Um, and, and that's really astonishingly put what I wrote about in this paper into relief. Um, you know, it's almost like Putin has decided to lay on a, a demonstration of the urgency of what you know, Melissa and I were talking about in the autumn and we decided, you know, it, it would be interesting to turn into a paper. Uh, so, no, it, it's, it, it, I mean, obviously it's, 
terrible to watch what's happening in Ukraine. I've got many friends in, in, in Kiev and elsewhere in Ukraine who, who I'm desperately worried about. Um, but it's not just the threat, the, state, the, the, the fate of Ukraine that's at stake. It, it feels like a, a far bigger battle is being fought over the, over the fate of the direction of, of, of the world. And, um, and that's why what the Ukrainians are doing is so important and why the example that they're setting is so extraordinary. Oliver, thank you for that. I think you've captured that sentiment really well. Um, Heather, let me bring you in here. I mean, how, how has kleptocracy related to this conflict, to fueling this conflict, and how does our response to kleptocracy offer a prospect of potentially ending this conflict? Damon, thank you so much. It's so great to be with you and congratulations, Oliver, for the paper and all the really powerful work uh, that Ned has been doing on, on this topic. I, I just, I wanna pull just a, a quick moment from, from Oliver's comments. I mean, look what it took to shake the West out, out of its lethargy. It took a, a, a major war in Europe, not seen since the second world war to actually start addressing our challenge. And, and, and as I said, I, I am grateful for the transformation that we are seeing the announcements. I will be more impressed when I see implementation and execution uh, of, these, of these powerful words. And Oliver is right. What the Ukrainian people, very much embodied by President Zelensky, are showing the West is what courage looks like and the costs of freedom, because this isn't about NATO or the European Union or the United States. This is about the Ukrainian people being able to freely choose their leaders and their direction. And that is something uh, that cannot occur in Russia under Vladimir Putin's leadership. So it is about freedom, freedom and democracy. It's very simple. And we are seeing that play out every single day. So let me, you know, in some ways, again, pulling back, you know, uh, over 30 years ago, as we witnessed the collapse of the Soviet Union, we were so enthusiastic thinking about Russia's integration uh, with, with, with Europe, with the United States. Uh, and in, yes, in many ways, we are seeing a, a great economic integration with Russia into the West. But the other thing that we didn't understand completely is that we also imported a lot of Russia's behavior and kleptocratic behavior right into our societies. And I think that's what we see today. For those of you who have read Karen DeWish's uh, Sentinel, uh, Putin's Kleptocracy, or read Catherine Belton's, this was an export of Putin's model in St. Petersburg, to be quite honest with you. This is how he advanced himself, and they exported that into various willing capitals. Um, and so in many ways, what we are seeing that uh, in, in, in a microcosm play out, whether that's in London, whether that's in, you know, the Netherlands, in Italy, Hungary, what the United States, what, what have you. Simply put, um, you know, corruption is an affront to the dignity of the individual. And I think that is what this comes down. It's a very personal Thing. So when there is such a, you know, a reckless abandon of, of corruption and the unequalness of this, it is deeply disrespectful, is dis disrespective uh, to citizens. And that's what we respond against. And democracies are supposed to be transparent and, and governments held accountable. That's why we require a free media to investigative journalism to bring that transparency and then to have a judicial process to hold individuals accountable for their behavior. And when that system breaks down, then you have neither accountability or transparency. And, and I've been uh, preparing, uh, I'm testifying before the Senate Armed Services Committee very soon about you know, where US global strategy is and I put this issue, corruption, and, and what the Russians, and of course the Chinese are also uh, eager students of learning this technique, what do we need an aircraft carrier for if we can purchase the democracy from the inside, if we can influence political leaders, parties, uh, the private sector, we can rig this and we really don't need, uh, you know, that military strategy. It's an, it's, it is, uh, you know, the enemy from within. It is, it is using and, and determining democratic choice by purchasing it. So this couldn't be more important. I'm so glad the West has fully woken up 
uh, to to the crisis, but at such extraordinary cost for the Ukrainian people. But I, you know, I'm worried that this rhetoric and this moment will dissipate quickly because what we are talking about is disrupting and dislodging Russian influence that goes to the top of European governments. Uh, it goes to the top of boardrooms co of corporate America, as well as European, uh, European companies. This is going to hurt to rip this out of our system, but it's the only way we can be effective in meeting the, the, the challenge of this moment and beating back authoritarianism. Heather, you've been, uh, you have a lot of credit for helping our country define corruption and kleptocracy as a national security issue. So shout out to, to your contribution to this cause. Um, I, I want to turn to Oliver. Heather mentioned that she acknowledged that the steps that are taken in response to Russia's invasion seem impressive. She's going to hold accountable to see implementation. What is your assessment, Oliver, of the steps that uh, have, have been taken since Russian troops entered Ukraine? I completely agree with Heather. There's been an awful lot said in the last five days. Um, I think we need to make sure that hopefully this crisis will pass and pass quickly. And, you know, we can go to, back to rebuilding you know, the damage that's been done to Ukraine. But we absolutely need to make sure that our governments follow through on the promises that they've made um, in, of all, in all directions, governments in, in the European Union, UK, obviously, and, and, and in the US. Um, I think we need to really to understand the importance of those promises. We need to look at what kleptocracy is. It, it, it really challenges our ideas of what constitutes a political system because democracy, autocracy, aristocracy, they, they exist within countries. Kleptocracy exists transnationally. It is a system that relies on the international financial system to hide and move the stolen wealth of nations that the oligarchs are stealing. Um, and, you know, this is, and if you look at the skills that, that Putin, you know, coming out of the KGB and from the St. Petersburg administration had, or his friends or the other Russian oligarchs, the skills they had were particular. They were good at bullying people, stealing things, killing people, um, invading sovereign nations, things like that. Um, these are not the kind of soft skills that you require if you're going to succeed in the globalized economy. They needed people who were able to, to advise them on capital, um, capital raising on international markets, on bond issuance, in, in initial public offerings, you know, on, on defending their reputations from you know, journalists like me who might want to write about them and so on. Um, you know, and for that, they needed our enablers, whether those were, you know, bankers in London, um, lawyers in New York, um, you know, politicians, let's face it, in, in Paris or Berlin. Um, you know, they needed people who could ease their passage into the international financial system. And sadly, they found those people and they found them far too easily. Um, they have been able to bring their wealth out of Russia and, and spread it around, hidden behind multiple layers of shell structures in multiple different jurisdictions. So it is, you know, you know, like an egg in a cake, it is deeply baked into the fabric of the globalized economy and extracting it is going to be very hard. But some of the promises <clears throat> that have been made, not just this week, but also, you know, if you look, say, at the US Corporate Transparency Act, you know, what was that now, 14 months ago or so, um, you know, have been you know, really heartening and, and, and really positive. Um, obviously, the US Corporate Transparency Act is great. Uh, <clears throat> the UK technically already has corporate transparency, but because the information isn't verified, it's not very good, to put it mildly. Um, so supposedly, uh, tomorrow, uh, a new bill is going to be introduced to Parliament here, which will solve parts of that trouble, um, similar uh, measures in continental Europe. Um, but again, um, if these measures, if these laws which are if these bills which are passed into law are not adequately enforced if the the you know the the uh, law enforcement agencies the anti-money laundering regulators the financial intelligence units and so on are not enforced properly <clears throat> it doesn't matter how good the law is <clears throat> it's like building a forging a great sword and then not having anyone to wield it um you know so what we really need to make sure is that all of these great initiatives and great laws and so on are used and are adequately resourced in the next years because you know unbaking the cake of international kleptocracy getting not ju not just russian money as heather said we're also talking chinese money and then you know in smaller quantities but in a way no less significant you know venezuelan money angolan money egyptian money malaysian money you know there are so many countries that have been looted by their rulers and that money 
you know, poured into our cities, into, into Los Angeles, Miami, New York, and London, Paris, you know, the south of France. It, it's been Vancouver, a huge outflow of money from stolen um, and, and, and ending up in our cities. But, you know, to, to go back to Russia, because obviously Russia remains a key focus. 51%, I mean, this is the estimate from Gabriel Zuckman, um, the economist, um, and he's come at this number from lots of different directions and he keeps coming back to this number. More than half of all of the wealth in Russia is owned offshore. It is outside of the country. And that money is owned overwhelmingly, considering the incredible inequality of Russian society, by the tight circle around Putin. And the really important lesson to learn from that number, 51% of household wealth owned offshore, is that we sanction Russia we can freeze the assets of the central bank. We can, you know, drive the, make the ruble markedly weaker, really undermine the foundations of the Russian economy. It makes no difference at all to someone whose assets are in dollars, pounds, euros, or, or any other hard currency kept offshore. That money is safe. It is stashed in London and Paris and Switzerland and wherever. And unless we can track down that money, find it and freeze it, confiscate it and return it to the people it was stolen from, we won't have done our job. And so this is why corporate transparency is so important and why that is an issue that we need to keep banging away at. And as I, I bore everyone I talk to about corporate transparency, but it's so important because this is the, you know, the, the screen behind which the money is, is hidden. You can rip that away, you know, lift up the rock and you can see what the, the cockroaches are doing. That's what we need to do. And, um, and, and I, yeah, I'm hopeful that these measures will, will, will help break the logjam that we've had for a long time. But if it's not adequately resourced, um, on both sides of the Atlantic, then it isn't going to achieve what in this extraordinary moment we're hoping it will achieve. So Oliver, you underscored the urgency of implementation. Heather, you made the same point, um, but some of these issues are systemic. And so how do you see, how do you see sh these short-term actions and an urgent implementation? How do you think they can impact the course of Putin's decision-making in Ukraine, Heather? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, honestly, the, the Biden administration's decision as well with the European Union to, to sort of curtail the Russian central bank's ability to manage and soften uh, these sanctions, what, you know, what we are witnessing today, basically the freeze of the Russian financial system, that's obviously hitting uh, citizens. And, you know, the Kremlin has to be monitoring the number of demonstrations, 6,000 arrested, if that number is accurate. You know, and this protest, you know, they are likely to continue continue um, potentially. I mean, obviously, the, re the repression is going to be uh, extraordinary. Uh, but, but Oliver is exactly right. Some of the most powerful things that we can do, and I think, quite frankly, we're going to do it by accident, in freezing some of these bank resources uh, and hitting some of these oligarchs, it's sort of as the US did a few years ago when we sanctioned Oleg Deripaska, you sort of lit up the board a little bit. In some ways, we didn't know what was underneath and how entwined it was until we blew the circuits. And then of course, we made some quick adjustments because actually we impacted the global aluminum market. Uh, and again, this, this is going to require sacrifice. And I think this is again, some of the, the messages that uh, uh, transatlantic leaders in particular are going to have to start giving. If we, you know, if people are really clear about ripping Russian money, the enablers that Oliver mentioned out of the system, you know, GDP is going to take a hit in the Netherlands, in the city, in Cyprus, uh, in the state of Delaware, in Wyoming, in Nevada. I mean, the, you know, there is freedom is not free. And for far too long, our systems have gorged on this uh, on this this illicit nature. So first of all, prepare for sacrifice. I think we're going to ac accidentally bang into some of these sanctions uh, through through accident, which which will be good. Again, transparency, understanding the complexity is is really the key. We have been uh, in our work, particularly when we talked about the Kremlin Playbook Two, and we we called it the enablers, exactly to get to an understanding of what those. Western enabling forces. I, I have to say, when we first, uh, when we did our first report, we looked at pr predominantly Central Europe, also Western Balkans. There was sort of this assumption: oh well, you know, those states—they're still, you know, 
entangled in communism. That's why they can't seem to force their way through through this corruption. Yeah, but our report looked at the, the enablers were in Western Europe. Uh, they were the ones that were flouting these rules for those illicit gain. And so in some ways, the, the cynicism of, of this is, is pretty extraordinary. But we don't have the structural ability, in my view, for a sustained execution of a, a major anti-corruption strategy. Again, for, I can speak to the US system. Uh, Oliver has a better sense of, of the UK and elsewhere. Our financial system and the sanctions are still very geared to financing of, of terrorism. So after 9-11, we just created all these structures to fight uh, terrorism financing, understandably. But the system was unable to, to reboot itself and now focused on uh, money laundering, illicit financing, corruption of authoritarian regimes. And we don't have the structures that we need, the fusion centers, that, which brings in intelligence, uh, make sure we can track down those bank accounts needing those, the, the legislative fixes uh, to make sure that these loopholes are closed. That's what worries me because we play sort of this whack-a-mole. We are, we are moving to an you know a crisis, so we will hit this oligarch in this crisis, and then it dissipates. We're not structured to do this, and it will take literally global networks to track this down because of the complexity, we're going to have to root it out at the enabling point. So shut down those letterbox companies that are being formed, those shell companies, the tax havens. But again, this comes back to sacrifice. This is going to shave points off of the UK's GDP, uh, many other countries. And you know that is our sacrifice. The Ukrainian people are sacrificing their lives right now. We're going to sacrifice some GDP and we're going to be so much stronger for it. That's the thing. If we don't rip this stuff from, from out from, uh, from within us, Russian influence, Chinese influence, what have you, we can't be strong uh, externally in meeting the challenges that they're presenting because they know the enemy from within, they can use these uh, malign influences to help you know, shift public opinion, shift votes, uh, influence political leaders. And of course, in some ways we are seeing some reflection of that uh, already. So. This is where we have to really get serious about structurally uh, focusing on this. And I think it's going to be so much more impactful. We don't want to harm the Russian people. We want to give the Russian people uh, the respect and dignity they deserve. Certainly Alexei Navalny and the Anti-Corruption Foundation, before it was destroyed and he was poisoned and jailed, was speaking to that 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 affront to dignity. Thank you, Heather. Your, um, your work focuses on strength, strengthening transatlantic cooperation. And you underscored, I think both of you have the importance of democratic unity. If, you know, it's who's going to make sacrifice if others are not. And yet, isn't this a moment? Isn't this a moment we've seen Switzerland join the EU, you know, the United Kingdom, the US and Canada, Japan? Isn't this a moment? How, talk about how democratic unity is, is essential for an effective kleptocratic strategy. And maybe there's an opportunity now that was unimaginable, you know, a month ago. So important because you cannot be neutral in this in this battle, uh, and I think that's exactly everyone thought. Well, this is okay. This is a no. You 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 have to. There's this is a time for clarity. Um, it is a time of of choosing, and I think the important work that we need to do. One of the criticisms uh, for me for U.S. policy over the last um, decade plus two decades has been we've evolved to. Uh, focusing on the government to government, the leaders, we call them stableocracy, meaning we, we, we want stability, so we deal with the leaders that we have. Meanwhile, we try to close our eyes to the patronage networks and the ill-gotten gains that they sit upon because we want that, that stability. Now is the time to quadruple down on support for civil society, for investigative journalism, for transparency, for the people to hold governments accountable. But that's a little scary because that will uh, open up, uh, a, you know, potentially a Pandora's box, whether that's the Pandora Papers, the Panama Papers, what have you, it exposes the level of corruption. And that's, that's sort of the maliciousness of this, because in some ways, uh, whether it's inspired by the Kremlin or or other authoritarians, you know, by exposing the corruption, you reduce you know confidence in democracy. Uh, but by continuing it, 
you also, uh, you know, it really punish democracy as well. So this is where accountability, transparency, openness, this is what we have to recommit ourselves. This is what President Zelensky was struggling with, quite frankly, right up to this conflict. He, he was slowing down in that transparency and accountability, which is why he was very much voted uh, in. So again, um, these issues are absolutely existential. We have to give civil society the tools and, and governments have to hold one another accountable for that, that transparency, which is absolutely vital. Heather, you were singing, uh, singing my song. I love that, that uh, it is a time to double down on civil society, on the NGOs, on the investigative journalists that hold uh, folks accountable, and that they'll be the best allies ensuring implementation of all of these measures. So, so Oliver, let me come back to you. Um, you phrased this whole challenge of transnational kleptocracy, trying to get in the minds of people understanding what we're dealing with. Say it combines 19th century autocracy with 20, 21st century finance. Sort of ex explain what you mean by that in terms of helping viewers really understand the nature of what transnational kleptocracy is. Well, the, I mean, the issue is that I mean, if you just look at what P Putin is doing, you know, he is jailing his critics, he is, is stealing resources, he's invading his neighbors. All of these things make him look like, you know, well, a czar, right? Uh, you know, the, this is the kind of things which which rulers in Europe used to do in, in the 19th century. This was fine in those days, um, apparently. Uh, and yet that is to misunderstand the nature of his regime and particularly the nature of, of his close group of friends who, who don't trust each other any more than they trust us. You know, these are not Russian aristocrats who have estates, you know, in large estates and huge quantities of peasants who they well, own. Um, you know, and who can't go anywhere and that their wealth derives from extracting wealth from their peasants. These are people who, who control oil wells, gas wells, you know, natural resources, and, and who extract the wealth from, you know, a, a, an asset of that nature. And then that money can just be sent wherever. It can be sent, sold into international markets and the money is, is kept, you know, offshore. So you end up with a totally different model. The, the, this, this idea that just because they're thuggish, therefore they must be somehow old fashioned is 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 wrong you know they are profoundly new fashioned it is a new model um of government which has emerged i mean it, it has been emerging for 50 years but it has accelerated in 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 lots of countries this this you know unaccountable elite who are able to sort of combine um the lifestyle somehow of a kind of medieval baron with a lifestyle of an instagram influencer um in one unholy whole um, you know, particularly their children, right? These, you know, these children are sort of, you know, little princelings who, who once upon a time would have been, you know, learning how to beat, you know, their their, their servants with a with a knut in in you know in, in ancient Russia. Now they're just, you know, hanging out on on yachts in Mykonos or, or you know going to, you know, the the art Basel in Miami. Um, it's uh, it, you know, it is a sort of gross perversion of celebrity lifestyle that they that they're living like celebrities and yet the money comes from you know profound human suffering rather than from selling you know a huge quantity of, of, of downloads on Spotify. Um, so you know that's what I mean by that combination of the 19th century and the 21st century. But you know the point I was making in a way which we began about the you know a, a, a new cold war a sort of the comparison of anti-kleptocracy with anti-communism is one I was quite keen to talk about a bit because you know anti-communism it, it isn't, you know, the, the anti-communism fight was not, as, as you in, in the United States know more than anyone, was not an entirely morally pure battle. You know, McCarthyism is a, is it was, it was a real problem. It definitely went too far. But, but the aspect of it that I was hoping to draw out was anti-communism, certainly as the Cold War went on, was quite good at encouraging Western countries to be better versions of themselves. You know, if we see the reasons given during the debate in Congress, for the passing of the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. My mind's gone blank, I think in 1978, but definitely in the 1970s, apologies for that. Um, you know, they, they're specifically saying, we cannot have Western corporations behaving like this because it gives, you know, our enemies ammunition with, to throw at us. You know, the same, you know, the British Empire, let's face it, you know, the British Empire, the sort of supposedly the arsenal of democracy in the Second World War, it, it was an empire. Right? It, it ruled large quantities of the world just because they were foreign. 
yeah, this is not, yeah, this was not a, a democratic project. And yet the, the, the language of anti-communism and the, the need to be democratic was, was used against that project as a way of unwinding it and, and forcing Britain to set these people free. So, so within that, you know, the idea of, of framing anti-kleptocracy anti as a new mobilizing force, as opposed to just anti-autocracy or just anti-tyranny, is it, is it means that it will force us to, to stop doing, you know, these kind of things that Heather was describing, these sort of, you know, to stop doing the enabling roles, because these things are anti-democratic. They are Western countries allying with the kleptocrats against their own people in order to earn fees. And, and if we can frame that as being profoundly anti-democratic, then we can try and reboot, as it were, the moral compass in our own societies. And, and instead of allying with the kleptocrats to earn a fees for the city of London and, and, and Zurich and Delaware and so on, we can start you know, allying with the civil society activists in Ukraine and elsewhere and say, no, we should be helping them to rebuild their own country, their own countries. And to be honest, you know, yes, it's right, there will be a, a hit to GDP in the short term in certain places. But in the long run, a society that is ruled in the interests of everyone rather than just in the rule interests of the kleptocrats who are looting its resources is a far richer society. It is a society with which we can trade and everyone will get richer. You know, it is, you know, there, there's a reason why stable democratically run governments which have which produce provide the rule of law for their societies, why these societies are infinitely richer than places where everyone's just stealing everything that isn't nailed down. You know, and if we can spread that kind of stability and, and democracy around the world, we'll all be better off. So the hit to GDP will only be a temporary one. Um, and it will only be for certain segments of the population. And to be honest, you know, admittedly, I'm not personally exposed to the top end of the property market, but if the London or New York top end of the property market takes a bit of a hit, I'm fine with that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Oliver. Um, you, you talked about framing the struggle against kleptocracy is part of how we think about our commitment to democracy, the struggle against autocracy. So Heather, um, that's in some respects, that's exactly what the Biden administration was trying to do. At the Summit for Democracy, the administration released a national strategy on countering corruption and kleptocracy ahead, ahead of that summit to focus on the transnational dimensions of kleptocracy. And it, it was met with a lot of support from both sides of the aisle here. And so how do you see and what was set to be this year of action? I hope now it's a year of action in 2022 on steroids in the wake of a Russian invasion of Ukraine. How do you see that becoming a real framework and how can democracies respond to transnational kleptocracy around the world in a coordinated fashion coming out of that summit but fueled by, by the war we see right now? Yeah, Damon, I, I have a concern. I mean, I, let me begin by saying I, I, I am so happy that the Biden administration has elevated the fight against corruption as a core national security interest, and, and they are focusing on a whole of government strategy. Do not get me wrong. What I am concerned about, though, is that we're going to slide back to where we were. We put anti-corruption in this frame of governance of rule of law that, okay, we'll shift that over. AID, State Department, you keep working on that. That's just great. And it is great, but it is not putting it to what Oliver said was, this, is, this goes to the very center of our national security. It impacts our elections with malign influence. Uh, it, it, it corrupts uh, our leading political figures. It shapes uh, our thinking about things. We have got to elevate this and make this a key focus. So what I worry about is that it gets sort of placed over here and it's nice to do and we've said lots of important things about it and then we shift back to you know the next crisis that, that we will face this has got to be a national security issue that's why i mean i'm talking about this in front of the senate armed services committee uh, this is this is about the national security of the nation and that's how we have to to elevate uh rooting this out and it is, it's, it's obviously making our democracy stronger and sign me up for whatever makes our democracy stronger. Let's always start at home, make sure we're strong at home so we can be strong overseas. 
Uh, and Oliver is exactly right. Yes, this um, we will, you know, countries will take a GDP hit because they've created their economies based on kleptocracy, but they will be so much healthier and more productive in 21st century, uh, whether that's, you know, digitalization or green tech or the new economy, that's where we want our strong, vibrant economies to be, not facilitating kleptocrats and their human rights violations. So, um, but, but I worry, uh, and I hope my worry is completely misplaced, but if we put this into a process and processize it to death and white paper it to death, we're not gonna get there. We need action. And this is what I'm hoping, hoping the sanctions and the clampdown on banks, uh, opening accounts, shell companies being created, tax havens. But this requires leadership and real political courage, which we have not yet seen. The words are strong, but you know, Oliver, you tell me when the when the, the UK government decides to close tax havens and kick that money out, then you then we are in a different place. And I am going to have two big pom-poms waving um, and cheering on that political courage. But that's what is needed right now. Not another summit of action and let's do this, uh, which is that's great. Uh, we've got to root this out uh, and, and root it out immediately. Uh, is that it's not just Russia, it's China, it, it's, it's elsewhere. So let's hope we're, we're in a better place very soon and using this unbelievable tragedy as, 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 a, as our own call to action to, to force change. You know, uh, Heather reminds me, Heather and I had the full disclosure opportunity to serve together in the US government and we're partners in crime, if you will, in trying to prevent a lot of these types of crimes. Um, but it, from an experience of bureaucratic uh, organizations, bureaucratic politics, part of the challenge with kleptocracy is how do you mobilize a national security and foreign affairs element with a programmatic and, and uh, assistance-based team, but along with all of the folks on the financial and domestic side that aren't used to playing this game. It's a complicated set of actors to align. And I think that's gonna, um, that's why part of what we've been arguing for is that you've got to think of democracy and the, con the, the, the fight against autocracy and kleptocracy as overall strategy, that it's knit together at a leadership level and from, from the White House itself. Um, both of you have talked about the price that, that Western democracies have to play by taking on the enablers. And Oliver, your report really does highlight the role of enablers in open societies including the offshore systems, the Western financial institutions, and Western sanctions on Russia today include those that target closing opportunities in our own financial institutions that have enabled Putin's regime for years. Can you explain just for a little bit how you would expect these sanctions targeting opportunities for transnational kleptocracy in the UK, in the US, how would that impact Russia if we are effective at targeting the enablers? Well. I mean, at the moment, the sanctions have been very broad and in a way, and, you know, hopefully other things will be coming, but in a way it feels a little bit like they're sanctioning Russia as if it was a normal country. Um, you know, they've hit the central bank, they've hit the banking system, they've hit its primary industries, they've restricted high-tech imports and exports. And these things are all great. Um, they will hopefully impede its ability as a country to wage war on Ukraine and to threaten other places. But I don't see many signs yet that they've targeted Russia as a kleptocracy. Um, and I would like to see more of that. Um, I think in order to target oligarchs, you need to think like an oligarch and, and see how oligarchs run their businesses and structure their businesses you know people who have stolen their assets when they structure their assets they don't think in terms of necessarily maximizing their profits or minimizing their taxes they think about maximizing their opacity and minimizing their chance of having their assets confiscated i don't see that we as an alliance have really taken that on board um, i think I mean, we have good lists of oligarchs published by Navalny, published by other people. We 
we know very well that oligarchs hide assets, not just through shell companies that they do, but also through their family members. So there's a degree of sort of machismo. We've certainly seen it in the UK with the Foreign Secretary Liz Truss saying that she's got a list of 100 oligarchs ready to go. You know, I would far rather see 30 oligarchs sanctioned plus 70 family members if that meant that we were actually going to hit the business empires hard. Because as we saw after 2014, when Ukrainians who were accused of having looted the country were sanctioned, because their family members weren't sanctioned alongside them and because there was no real effort to cut through their shell companies, it, you know, it was personally inconvenient for the individuals who had to live in their mansion in Moscow for a bit instead of their mansion in the south of France but it didn't really impede the movement of money or affect the, their calculations as individuals. So um, yes, it's good that the central bank has been hit. It has definitely shaken the foundations of you know, Fortress Russia, which we heard a lot about, um, and the ability of, of Putin to defend the ruble. But again, you know, and I say this again and again and again, a collapse in the ruble um, though it will harm the Russian economy, will, in terms of individual Russians, will harm the people who aren't to blame, you know, which are people who rely on, you know, buying imported food or imported clothing, things like that, which will now double in price, if not more, just today. Um, you know, they won't harm people whose assets are in dollars or in pounds or in, or in euros. Um, so, yeah, think like an oligarch. That's my, my, you know, my message. I was talking to someone just now who said that I could write a really, um, really rubbish self-help book you know like you always have these sort of you know think like a ceo or whatever think like an oligarch um but it's because it's not about they, these these are business people who aren't thinking only about maximizing value they're thinking about minimizing scrutiny and that's a different calculation which results in different outcomes and so you know i would i don't think the uk has got there at all um you know the law enforcement in the uk remains very underfunded um, and, and chronically underfunded. Um, the US is m in a much better place in that regard. But even in the US, I'd say the Financial Intelligence Unit, for example, requires more people um, just to be able to get through the, the, the kind of volume of work that's demanded of it. Um, you can't fight the war to defend democracy on the cheap. And that's I think, something we've been trying to do for too long. Oliver, I want to pick up on that point for both Heather and you as, um, as we begin to draw towards the end of our conclusion. The truth is, is that the governments are mobilized right now around Russia, but this is not about 20 oligarchs here. It's a systemic issue um, from China, Central Asia, Latin America, Africa. The scale of this, as you just talked about under-resourced law enforcement is kind of astonishing. How, how does this momentum around Putin's invasion of Ukraine how does it help fuel what actually is a more systemic challenge of global autocracy that is gnawing away at democratic progress on every continent? Um, the scale of this is not just a list of 20 oligarchs. And so, Heather, how do you think about you know, managing the, the, all, the, all the, wor the, the, the work that goes into targeting 20 oligarchs when we're really talking about a systemic global issue? How does the transnational battle to fight transnational kleptocracy become effective on a global scale. This is exactly it. You use this crisis to create, uh, you know, the new processes, the new systemic approach. Uh, it's funding very complex law enforcement financial interaction. I mean, it's, it's, as Oliver noted, I mean, the, the kleptocrats are innovating financial instruments faster than the regulators and elsewhere can develop. I mean, they're genius. This is sort of think, think like an oligarch. They're already three steps ahead of regulators. This is trans-border. I, I mean, the complexity here for, for opacity. So you, you cannot follow all the breadcrumbs. You don't have all the bilateral agreements um, uh, globally. So it, this is where I just keep getting back to structure. We have to structure ourselves to be able to fight this globally. Russia is the most egregious example, but there are absolutely others and you know, hiding in real estate uh, wealth, the ultimate beneficial ownership, all, all of that, absolutely essential. So this is what, you know again, 
leadership, transatlantic leadership is going to, to be required, but we have to fundamentally restructure ourselves and prioritize this. This means continuing to shift somewhat away from uh, uh, fire, terrorism financing and that, that focus on that. We're still very postured for that. It's, it's walking a little bit away. I mean, when our treasury and law enforcement authorities go after funding, like they go after fraud because that's the biggest numerical value that they're trying to focus on in the US. They're not prioritizing necessarily the national security implications of illicit financing or money laundering. They're, they're going where the money is and that's where they can set their own uh, objectives. Again, I think this is slowly changing the work that Ned's doing, that Oliver's are doing, Oliver and, and others are doing, that's creating that. But unless we restructure ourselves and we prioritize this, we're just going to have another example of, of you know, money laundering and things that are happening that we're, we'll learn about after the fact. So structuring this and in, in getting the key enabler countries and governments at that table and moving the needle a little bit, I, I think that will, that will be helpful. Um, again, to get back to Oliver's point, this is about ensuring freedom and our, you know, strengthening our democracy. Nothing can be more important. So this comes back to the principle of what we're trying to do here. We're not trying to chase 30 kleptocrats, we are trying to ensure our democratic institutions function and that people uh, can freely choose their government. And, you know, kleptocracy works against both those objectives. Mm -hmm. So, so Oliver, thanks. Thank you, Heather. Oliver, how can, if you're advising Liz Truss or Boris Johnson, how can they come at this not with whack-a-mole tactics that leave, you know, you know, they're weighing a cost to, to London, but how could the Brits actually transform this to lead and support a more global systemic approach, recognizing the scale of the challenge isn't for one minute uh, limited to Russian or, or Ukrainian oligarchs? Um, it, it, it really feels to me like at the moment, um, the UK government and, and I would think probably less so in the US, but certainly in the EU as well, see the battle against kleptocracy is something to be dealt with with sanctions yeah you 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 see a problem and you sanction it and and that's fine um but sanctions should be the cherry on the cake right they should be you know the the button on the on the dashboard of the spaceship that you press when you really need to get out of trouble but it's it's not the whole system sanctions are the, are the, are the extra thing that it's really nice to have on top of everything else that you do so you know what what we really need is is you know if it to go back to a to a to a i mean we need to invest in you know the engine of the spaceship and making sure that it's you know aerodynamic and that the wings work all of the things which make a spaceship work and then once you've got all of those and you've got a spaceship which is extremely powerful then you can have a button for an overdrive when you need it but you can't rely on the overdrive all the time that's the issue and it's like we've, you know, everything's bypassed all the hard work and just gone straight to sanctions. It's like sanctions, dump the cost on the private sector, let the banks deal with it. And, and that's it. It's like, no, that, that doesn't work. If you want to solve the problem, you need to solve it. Like, like all best ways of solving a problem, you solve them before they happen, right? You don't, if you're trying to defend your borders, you don't wait till the enemy has is, is, is got to, you know, I don't know, deep into West Virginia before repelling them. You know, you, you, you stop them at the edge, right? You, you know, that's it. You don't, otherwise it's going to be way more complicated to root them out once they're already deep in your own territory. And that it's like, that's what we've got. We've said, yeah, bring, you know, to the kleptocrats, bring all your money in. That's absolutely fine. And then as soon as you invade a sovereign country, we'll, we'll dig out the money and bring it out and then throw it out again. Just don't let it in in the first place. That's it. And, and if we don't let it in in the first place, and if, if oligarchs have to keep their money in Russia instead of exporting it all offshore, then they will have a stake in the rule of law in Russia because they will want their government to have the rule of law because otherwise the government will take their money away from them. So, we're, you know, in a way, we'll, I mean, it, it, I don't expect the, the kleptocrats will see it this way, but we'll definitely be doing Russia a favour. You know? and, and in the long run, that's good for everyone because I firmly believe that if Russia had a government that was committed to democracy and the rule of law and, 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 and freedom between nations, then they'd be our friends. And that's what we want, right? We don't, none of us want to be in this annoying confrontation with Russia. None of us, you know, I remember um, President Obama referring to Vladimir Putin as being like your annoying kid brother. And um, I don't, it's nothing like my brother, I'm pleased to say, but, 
but but I know what he means. It's this sort of just just can we start thinking about the important things and not about you know just your weird three quarter life crisis that he's having at the moment. So no, I I I I think in the long run, if we don't let the money in in the first place, everyone is better off. And and so instead of focusing on sanctions and after the fact responses to oligarchs you know we need to proactively prevent them coming in in the first place you know and that requires not just new laws some new laws but but above all really a total overhaul of the entire law enforcement apparatus and to and to staff it as a crucial front line in in a national security defense that 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 it is instead of just thinking it as being like an adjunct to the police force that's tre tremendous. I think, Heather Oliver, tremendous way to, to wrap this conversation. Um, look, I think you made the point clearly that uh, the best way we can be friends of the people of Russia, Ukraine, China, and across Latin America, Africa, there are, there are leaders out there who are allowing the pillaging of their own people and using our systems to protect that wealth. And so I think the way to stand by the people of Russia, of all of these countries, is to, to be able to take the decisive action that both of you are calling for. I do think this is an opportunity. I do think some of the decisions we've seen coming out of uh, what is a horrific Russian attack on Ukraine have the power of, of mobilizing uh, collective action among democracies um, is really animated when people are confronted with the direct horror of what autocracy can deliver. And so part of this, I think you've both made the point, how can we and all, all of our work help steal ourselves for something that's not easy, but steal ourselves for, it, for what I certainly believe is going to require generational movement to defend democracy and to, to defeat tyranny, autocracy, kleptocracy. Um, these aren't just tackled with a sanction. This is an unwinding of a system, a vigilance and building that resilience. So I want to thank both of you because uh, Heather has been just a principled, outspoken advocate, pushing, cajoling uh, the United States and other allies uh, to do the right thing. And Oliver, you've helped map out, I think, a very important way, calling for uh, a democratic coalition uh, on this critical issue. What both of you have been advocating, it's been hard to see how we actually land there until Russia invaded Ukraine. How can this moment actually bring some of your ideas to fruition? So this is the work uh, that I am so proud of the National Endowment for Democracy. So many of our partners are contributing to, so many of our partners on the front lines, as well as our international forum, which is really focused on this as, as one of the existential challenges to democracy. So uh, I wanna thank Heather, I wanna thank Oliver for giving us your time, your insights uh, and your, your voice. I wanna give a shout out to our team, John Glenn, Chris Walker overseeing uh, this work, Melissa Ten who helped drive this forward along with Ryan Eric, uh, Mike Dugan, uh, Rochelle Faust, thanks to the whole team. And I wanna encourage all of you with us to, to come back uh, and stay with Ned for more discussions about how we can mobilize a generational commitment to defend democracy, defeat kleptocracy. Thank you all for being with us today.